Good morning and welcome to our second Sunday as Portadown Baptist virtually. Uh, thanks to Paul and to Matthew for getting us off to such a good start last Sunday. Uh, as I was watching last Sunday, I looked down at the encounter on YouTube and it was telling me that there were 110 people signed in watching our uh, our service on, on YouTube. And if you allow for couples and for families, that means probably in excess of 250 of us had uh, come together, although we are apart, uh, to worship the God that, that we love. Uh, this week, we're going to hear from John McDermott, um, who is our guest speaker for this week. And also this week, we're going to celebrate the Lord's table together. Now, don't panic. Uh, don't, don't worry if you're not already prepared for that. There will be opportunity um, before we go into uh, communion for you to, to go and get a piece of bread and some juice. And again, don't panic. Don't get yourself all worked up about the particular colour of the juice. That's not really the most important thing. The uh, most important thing is that we use the opportunity to, uh, to fellowship together and to celebrate uh, the Lord's table together. As I say, there will be a gap um, after I pray, after John um, speaks and before Anthony in Texas through uh, communion and there'll be a gap uh, to allow you to go out and get uh, what you need. It'll be on the screen, it'll be part of the video and it'll be very obvious where it comes. So don't be panicking, don't be worrying about that. that that'll become very obvious. It's been a very unnerving and daunting week we've just come through, hasn't it? Every day has brought worse news, it seems. Every day has brought new problems new restrictions that have been placed upon us. We're still getting used to new concepts such as social distancing um, and self-isolation. For very good reasons, we're being told to stay at home. Can I, can I implore you again to take seriously the advice that has been given to us and the guidance that is coming out from our medical experts um, and from the government, please do heed this advice and this guidance. Please do take it seriously. Uh, it is for your own personal safety and it is uh, for all our safety. Um, uh, and so we, we, we ask you again to, to take that ad advice to heart um, uh, and the guidance that is there and, and do, put it, do put it into, into, into practice. As I've been thinking through this week, that, uh, that little phrase in the Lord's Prayer, and give us today our daily bread, I think has come through with a, a, a sharpness, with a, a fresh meaning, more intense meaning than, if I'm honest, I think it has had, it has had before. We're still coming to terms with um, working from home, with, with being away from our colleagues at work, from being away from our friends, from being away from our family, from, uh, from being away from, from our church family, very definitely, but but never away from God. Psalm 139, I know, is a favourite psalm of, of many of us. And uh, I want to take a few moments this morning just and read the first 10 verses of Psalm 139. I'm, I'm going to read them from the New Living Translation. O Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up, you know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the grave, you're there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. The Life Application Bible gives this as the theme of Psalm 139. God is all-seeing, all-knowing, all-powerful and everywhere present. 
And that's not something we should fear, that sort of a God. Uh, for those of us that are God's children, that should bring us great confidence. That should bring us great hope, a great sense of peace to know that the God that we belong to sees all, knows all, is all-powerful and is everywhere. He's even here with us in the middle of this coronavirus pandemic. And it goes on. God knows us. God is with us. And his greatest gift is to allow us to know him. What a blessing it is to know that we can know God through his son, Jesus Christ. And what a blessing it is to know that God knows me. All that I do, all that I say, all that makes me, me. God knows and God loves. The Life Application Notes make this comment. God is with us through every situation, in every trial, protecting, loving, guiding. He knows and loves us completely. Now, while we are separated physically in these days, we want you to know that you haven't been forgotten about, that you still matter to us, that you're still constantly in our thoughts and in our prayers. We won't get to be able to see you the way we would like to be able to, but we're continually thinking of new ideas, new ways of reaching out, of connecting with you, so we can keep that bond, that connection that we have as a church family together. You may already know that we have set up the Portadown Baptist Church care team, and Richard Aladef is coordinating that team for us. And so if you're in self-isolation, or if you're in one of the vulnerable groups, then can I encourage you to reach out to Richard? Uh, you'll contact him on 07523 435 644. That's 07523 435 644. Please reach out to Richard with whatever need you might have. It might be some groceries or some shopping that that needs to be collected or maybe a prescription that needs to be picked up. Whatever it is, please reach out to Richard and he will put you in contact with one of the uh, volunteers that have signed up to be part of this team and they will be only too happy to help you. Please don't be afraid to reach out. Don't be shy about calling Richard and the team. We're all in this situation together. and We want to demonstrate the love that we have for each other in this very practical way. We're really encouraged by the number of you who have uh, already volunteered to be part of that care team. Uh, over 30 have already signed up uh, to be volunteers and what a blessing that is to us and what an encouragement. And we wanna thank every one of you for your willingness to be part of this time, to give of your time uh, to help to help others. And if you would like to join that team, uh, then you'd be very welcome to do that. Uh, again, please reach out to Richard, this time by email, um, and you'll uh, get uh, Richard on uh, online at portadownbaptist.com. That's online at portadownbaptist.com. Let Richard know you'd like to join the team, and he'll, um, he'll get you signed up with the team uh, and put you in contact with those that will, will need help. Please do volunteer for the team and uh, do use it if it's applicable. We've also sent out a letter to you over the weekend. If you haven't already got it, you should get it um, through your door um, early in the week. Um, a letter that contains uh, lots of information for you, uh, but a letter that more importantly uh, is there to remind you that um, we, we haven't forgot about you, we won't forget about you, and that you matter to us, and, and as I've said, that you're uh, constantly in our thoughts and in our prayers. Please feel free to reach out to any of the five of us if you want to talk with us. Something that's bothering you, something that's on your mind, something that you're not sure about, um, please uh, feel free to reach out to us. We'd be more than happy to take some time and uh, chat to you on the phone and more importantly, to pray with you and to help in that way. 
Uh, if you don't have our contact numbers, then they will be in the, the letter uh, that should be arising with, arriving with you uh, shortly. Uh, and the, also that uh, contact number that I gave out for Richard just a moment or two ago for the care team, uh, that will be on the letter as well. So please look out for that. It's good to, uh, I've been hearing about some of the initiatives that you're, um, you're using to keep connected, to keep in contact with each other. I've uh, been hearing about lots of WhatsApp groups uh, that have been started up. Why don't you think about starting up a WhatsApp prayer triplet? Three of you get together and um, video call every day just to see each other, just to chat, just to catch up and, and more importantly to to pray together. Let's keep talking. I lift the phone. Maybe think about the people that you sit around usually on a Sunday morning, those that you rub shoulders with as you come in and out of church, those that sit in that same area of the church where you normally sit. Maybe maybe get their number out of the directory and, and give them a call. Chat with them. Find out how they're doing. Let's let's keep those connections going. Let's let's keep talking. You remember well, BT told us all those years ago in their ads, it's good to talk. So let's keep talking. In a few moments, we're going to listen to John McDermott, who's the pastor of the Maharfeld Baptist Church, as he shares God's word together. And then after we have listened to John, then um, I will come back and uh, pray. And then I, I will hand over to Anthony, uh, who will lead us through communion. And so before we listen to John's message, uh, let's, let's pray together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your bigness. We thank you that you are all-seeing, all-knowing, all-powerful, and everywhere present. And while that might instill fear in some, it fills us with strength. In the middle of a pandemic, when we feel so powerless, so frightened by a microscopic virus, we take strength that you know us, that you go before us and you come after us, that your hand guides us and your strength supports us. Father, we struggle to make sense of any of this, if we're honest. We hardly at times know what to think. We hardly know what tomorrow will bring. Will you give us peace and strength by reminding us through your word that you know the end of all this for you're already there. You're already at the end of all this crisis. God, we thank you this morning that you're a God of mercy and compassion. Pour out upon our nation your mercy and your compassion, O oh Lord. I remember Kira out on the ship, not able to get home. Lord, we pray that you'll grant her your peace and that you will be her strength and her contentment as she's away from family. We pray this for the rest of those on board the ship as well, that they might know a touch from you and a blessing from you. I remember all our missionary family, wherever they are in the world, and this morning, in the midst of this global pandemic, God, we ask that you will be their protector and be their sustainer. And for us at home, parents getting used to having children at home all day, grandparents who can't get hold, get to hold their grandchildren, family who can't get to visit loved ones in hospital, Friends who can't get to spend time together. Employers struggling to do the right thing by their staff. Employees uncertain of future prospects as work dries up. Lord, we are so glad that you are not only interested in us on Sundays, but in every day of the week and everything that we do. You know us and you love us completely. We pray for each other as a church family. We pray for those facing the difficulty of poor health, even without the added pressure of COVID-19. 
for those in hospital, for those facing difficult days ahead, for those facing uncertain futures. Lord, we ask that you draw close to them and in your strength and they find support. You tell us to mourn with those who mourn. And so we pray for the families of Magdalene Mitchell, Ruth Burke and the others who have lost loved ones over this dreadful disease. May they reach out to you and find in you the God of all comfort. Father, we rejoice with those who rejoice this morning as well. And we rejoice with those who we have seen on our TV screens and our news broadcasts that are recovered and have recovered and are recovering from this disease. We rejoice with them and with their families. Oh Lord, in your mercy, grant us more of these rejoicing stories, we pray. We thank you that you're a speaking God. Through your word, you continue to speak to us. As we listen to John now, may your word come as a blessing to us and bring comfort to us. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning, meeting online from here in Macrofelt. I'd love to be with you, good folk, and pour it down in person. Uh, but given the circumstances, that just isn't possible. And so it is my delight to be able to bring God's word to you in these very unusual means uh, through uh, online. Uh, but we trust that the Lord will bless us as we do meet together. Um, and perhaps sometime in the future, I'll get the opportunity to renew fellowship with you in person. But we're going to turn to God's word. We're going to turn to Psalm 46, if you'd like to take your Bibles. And the psalmist writes, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress, Selah. Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars to cease, to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you for your word. And we pray that as we now come to consider it together, that, O oh Father, you would speak to us, that we would hear your voice, and that we would see Jesus. And that, O oh Father, we would bring you great glory. So help us as we are in our homes seeking to study together. Help us by the power of the Holy Spirit to bring you great honour by us being here today before your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now friends, we find ourselves facing unprecedented times. Never before in our lives have we, as a nation, in fact as a world, faced such a threat and arguably this is just the beginning in the week that has passed we have been locked down into our homes uh, the people that have been lost to the coronavirus is now in the tens of thousands and sadly there will be many more to come and this coronavirus that we face is no respecter of persons. The rich, the poor, the famous, the unknown, all are affected alike. All are equally challenged by this virus. And this causes panic in our world. Panic that we, even as God's people, are not immune from. 
we walk into our supermarkets and shops and the shelves are emptying, people are panic buying. There are many businesses that are closing, our economy is in jeopardy, our routines are altered like never before and all of this is going to be for the foreseeable and all is so uncertain in our lives. In fact the only thing that we can be certain of today is that we are not in control. And all because of an unseen enemy called COVID-19. This enemy is turning our world upside down. And the question for the Christian has to be, does God have anything to say to us from his word? Is there anything in the Bible that can encourage us in days like this and bring us comfort? Is there anything to stir up faith in the midst of a fear-filled world? And well, the answer to that question is a resounding, yes, there is. And Psalm 46 is one of the places that we can turn to for such comfort at such times as this. Psalm 46, the original context of it is unknown. And and so we don't know when it was written and into which context it was being applied originally. But that allows us then to look at our own situation and apply the principles that we find here to our own situation today. And there are three main principles that the psalmist brings to our attention. The first one is found in the first three verses. And there we find that we can be secure in the midst of trouble. He says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way. Though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. Though its water roar and foam. Though its mountains tremble at its swelling. Sila. And here the psalmist, as he begins this psalm, he insists that God is our only protection when trouble comes our way. And the particular troubles that he has in mind in these opening verses are natural disasters. He talks about earthquakes, he talks about stormy waters, he talks about unstable mountains. He's referring to times when it seems that all hell is breaking loose. And at times like that, it is God and God alone that we can look to for protection. He alone is our refuge or our impenetrable fortress. In the mind of the psalmist, God and God alone is the place to which people can flee when trouble comes their way. And this is what the psalmist wants us to do with regards to God. He wants us to flee to him in the chaos. The verses 2 and 3 refer to this chaos that, that drives our minds back to Genesis chapter 1 when in creation and chaos was over the face of the deep and God moved by his power and brought order and brought calm. And now the psalmist wants us to think in such terms with regards to our troubles. You know, there's much in our world to cause us to fear. But the psalmist here calls us to be those who fear God more. Remember it was the Lord Jesus who said in Matthew chapter 10. And do not fear those who kill the body but who cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy the soul and the body in hell. And so the psalmist and the Lord Jesus insists that. Well we ought to have more respect and reverence for God. Than we have for any virus that's threatening our world today. And why? Well, because in God we have eternal security. Earthly security is not promised to anyone, but in God we have eternal security. In God, no matter what happens in life, nothing can change our future. Through trusting Christ, we can have security and therefore rest and have faith in the midst of a fear-filled world. And this has been the case for many of God's people down through church history. Back in AD 249 through to 262, the world was faced with one of the deadliest pandemics that it has ever faced. In fact, during that pandemic that was spreading through the known world, apparently in the city of Rome, there were 5,000 people who died in a single day. 
the non-Christian response of unbelievers at that point was well, self-protection, self-preservation. They avoided the sick at all costs and simply look after themselves. It was every man for himself. Much of how it is today in many places and with many people. But the Christian response was different. The Christians, they were the opposite to the non-Christians. And what enabled the Christians to show love and compassion and mercy and self-sacrifice at those times? Well, it was their eternal security. In their eternal security, they found hope and therefore they were able to serve the Lord with gladness and meet the need. Now, this isn't a call for recklessness. We are certainly to follow governmental lines, guidelines that they give us. But in the midst of all of that, let us also remember compassion. Let us remember to look out for one another. Let us remember to care for our neighbours uh, where we can and when we can with wisdom. All in the security that we have a hope that is steadfast and sure, that is immovable, that cannot be changed. We are secure in God who is our refuge. This is the first thing that the psalmist calls our attention to in this lovely psalm. We can be secure in God. And then following on from that, he tells us that we can be satisfied with God in verses 4 to 7. He says, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress, Selah. Now what you have happening here in verses 4 to 7 is the psalmist begins to contrast with what he's already talked about in verses 1 to 3. He now contrasts that in verses 4 to 7. And he contrasts it with a city. The city referring, obviously, to Jerusalem. The city where God's presence was in the Old Testament system and the economy. God dwelt in the temple amongst his people. And there was a river. Now, the city of Jerusalem never had a literal river running through it. And so the psalmist here is speaking symbolically of God's presence that was running through Jerusalem. And it was like a river. And any city, like with any river running through it, would be able to withstand any kind of siege, any kind of trouble that may come from an enemy. And that is the picture that the psalmist is trying to paint in the minds of his readers. He talks of this river as opposed to the, here's the contrasts, he talks of the river as opposed to the chaotic waters in verses 2 and 3, symbolising God's blessing, God's renewal. He talks about not being moved, which contrasts the, the mountains of verse 2. So where God dwells is a safe place to be, as opposed to one a shaking mountain. And he talks about uttering his voice, which contrasts the roars of the waters in verse 3. And so what is the psalmist getting at? He's basically pointing to God as a place of satisfaction and contentment. He's pointing to God as one who can bring peace to the chaos. Peace to the panic and calm to the chaos. Now, we're living in a world in which people up until now have been seeking satisfaction in many, many different things. Many of which are under threat in these days. They've sought satisfaction in their health and in their prosperity and their wealth. And all such things are, are now in jeopardy. All such things are now under threat. But here the psalmist calls our attention to this river. That can be the fount of our satisfaction. And the river points to the presence of God. Now today in the New Testament economy, the presence of God is firmly found in Jesus Christ. He is now how God reveals himself to us. We find this described in Hebrews chapter 1 in those opening verses. God now speaks through him. So Christ is now God's holy habitation. Christ is now the river that provides life. Christ is now the one that cannot be defeated and the refuge and strength in which we can abide in our trouble. Christ is our hope and none other. 
And all who trust in him are adopted into God's family by faith and are secure forever and find all of their soul's needs satisfied. But it's all in Christ and in no other. So this earthly disease that is coming our way and this is surely not to be ignored and is nothing to be joked about or laughed at. This disease that is destroying our earthly security, our prosperity, our health, that is destroying all those things that we often make idols of, we must remember that it is no match for our Saviour. Our Saviour remains enthroned above. Nothing can change that fact. And since he is our steady and sure refuge, we can run to him. We can be like Jehoshaphat of old. It said of Jehoshaphat when faced with his enemies, he said, Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you in Second Chronicles chapter 20. And so while we find ourselves in a situation in which we don't know what to do, let us say, Lord, our eyes are on you. This is what the psalmist calls us to do. He calls us to be secure in God. He calls us to be satisfied with God. In the 1850s, London was known to be the most powerful and wealthiest city in all of the world. Apparently, in those days, it had over 2 million in the population. And there was a Corolla outbreak in 1854 in which uh, fear was struck into the hearts of all Londoners. Charles Spurgeon was a pastor in the city at that time and he said that the plague was a storm that led many people to seek refuge in Christ the rock. And should that not be the case today for us? That in the midst of this storm that we should seek refuge in Christ the rock. For where else can we find refuge in these days? Everything else is changing. Everything else is under threat. Everything else is, has become such that cannot be depended upon. But Christ can be depended upon. For he hasn't changed. He remains forever the same. And this is what the psalmist describes with regards to God. With regards to this river that flows through this city. This holy habitation. He's pointing us to Jesus Christ. And so let us look to him and find the satisfaction that our souls long for in this fear-filled world. So the first thing he draws our attention to is the security that we find in God. Then we have the, the satisfaction we find in God. But then finally, in verses 8 through to 11, we are called to be still before God. Read with me those lovely words again from verses 8 to 11. He says, Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. So here in closing, the psalmist calls us to consider what God has been doing. He calls us to be still. And the New Bible Commentary translates that, those words be still as relax or rest. Simply trust. And notice the emphasis is upon all of the nations. All of the nations are to be still and to see what God is doing. And so the psalmist now calls and encourages all people everywhere. To examine God's works. And he uses imagery of bows. Imagery of spears. Imagery of, of chariots. Imagery of all these items of war. And he's simply doing that to highlight the power of God. How that all the arsenals of the world. All the powers that exist on the world are no match for him. The one who created all things. Who spoke all things into existence. Who upholds this universe by the word of his power. And nothing, not even a coronavirus, is a surprise to him. He controls all things. Sovereign over all. And his power 
ought to produce confidence in our hearts. This is the God that we worship. This is the God that the psalmist is talking about. And this God no longer resides in a temple like that described in verses 4 through to 7. This God now resides in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is how he has revealed himself in the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. See, Christ has replaced the Old Testament system of the temple. He is the new and greater temple that reveals God to us. He is God's presence. He is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. And so we must look to him, realizing that being secure in God, being satisfied in God, is purely and entirely a matter of being still before God. See, if you're to know his security, if you are to know his satisfaction, then there must be this stillness, there must be this trust, there must be this dependence, this confidence entirely in God. All other blessings are dependent upon this final thing that Paul, that, that the psalmist talks about. You know, a farmer was once asked, what do you do When there's a storm. And the farmer replied. I go inside and sharpen my tools. The farmer took a storm as an opportunity. To reflect upon necessary changes. That were required in his life. His tools. And what I would urge us all to do today. Is to not waste our isolation, but to actually use it as an opportunity to examine the necessary changes required in our lives. Primarily with regards to Jesus Christ. Are you still before God? Are you trusting in Jesus Christ? Is your faith resting entirely upon all that he has done through his sinless life, his sacrificial death, his glorious resurrection and ascension on high and his promised second return? Are you trusting and resting and being still with regards to those things? Or like the rest of this world, are you running around in a panic? Are you thinking about what you can do to to fix all that's, that's going wrong in your life and going wrong in our world? Such things are beyond your control and mine. And all we can do at such times as this is be still and know that he is God. That's what the psalmist calls us to do. See, all too often people in our world have been running around like those people in Babel in Genesis chapter 11, building that tower, building that monument without God's help. That's been our world, hasn't it? But yet, what we have going on now is something similar to what happened at Babel. At Babel, God came down, scattered the people and halted them in their work. God is halting us in our work. And that halting of work is enabling us to self-reflect. And so for those of us who know God, perhaps our priorities need reorientated. Perhaps we've been focusing on the wrong things. There hasn't been enough stillness in our lives. We've been caught up in the rat race that the rest of this world is caught up in. And we've lost our focus. We've lost our attention upon Christ. And we haven't had our eyes on him. Perhaps we need to reorientate. And this is providing an opportunity to do that. But then perhaps there's someone watching here today. And your eyes haven't been on Christ at all at any point in your life. You don't know what it is to be still. Oh sure, you like the idea of security. You like the idea of satisfaction. But when it comes to being still before God, oh no. Well, you're a master of your own destiny. You like to do your own thing. Well, friend, that will have to change if you are to know the blessings described in the psalm. If you're to know the blessings that are Found in the psalm, you need to realize that there's a greater enemy in this world than the coronavirus. You need to realize that the coronavirus is not your biggest problem. I don't want to make little of the coronavirus. But what I want to do is make much of your greatest problem, which is sin. All those things that you think, that you say, that you do, that displease God. Those things that, that bring you an enmity between God. That, be, that, that, that cause a, a barrier to exist between you and God. That it needs dealt with. And why? Well, because the coronavirus is an earthly problem, but your sin is an eternal problem. 
Your sin will result in eternal separation from God. And so you need to deal with that even greater problem than the coronavirus, which is your sin. And the only way for that to be dealt with is for you to rest, for you to relax, for you to be still before God and trust in all that Christ has done upon the cross. You need to realise that there's nothing you can do or anyone else in this world can do that your sins would be dealt with. What you need to do is trust entirely upon the finished work of Calvary where Jesus, lived, having, having lived a sinless life, died upon the cross, having shed his precious blood, that you would know the forgiveness of sins. This is the gospel. This is the good news. And it's experienced. It's applied by faith. And so this is the faith that you need in this fear-filled world. Will you turn to him? Will you call upon him? Will you rest upon Christ as your saviour and none other? He is your only hope in this world. And for the Christian, he is still your only hope. And I would urge you to look to him. And the eternal security that he provides will help you to serve your way through the difficulties that we are facing as a nation today. You know, back in 1519, and with this I'll come to a close, the Black Death reached Zurich in Switzerland. Zurich in Switzerland was the home of the pastor and the reformer Swingley. And Swingley had gone off on holiday whenever the Black Plague hit Zurich. It wiped out a third of the population and Swingley was advised by his friends and colleagues to not return home. But he refused to listen and was determined to go back and help care for the sick and to tell people about their need of the Lord Jesus. And what enabled this man to serve in this way, even though he actually ended up contracting the, the Black Death and was seriously ill, Nevertheless, he continued to serve the Lord as best he could. What enabled him to do that? It was the hope that he had in God. It was his eternal security. It was the satisfaction that he found in God. And it was all because he lived a life of stillness, trust, rest before God. And the challenge to all of us today is this. Are we resting in God? Are we running around like the rest of the world in a panic? The Christian has no real cause to panic because the Christian is in the arms of God. The Christian has no real cause for fear because Christ has risen, because Christ has ascended on high, because Christ will, will come back again. Because even if coronavirus comes our way personally, and we have to deal with it. And even if it takes us from this scene of time, we will live forever, basking in the glory of our Saviour. You know, Swingley, whenever he was faced with the black death and suffering, with all that that plague had brought to him, he wrote a lot of poems. And one, of the, one sentence out of one of the poems that he wrote were these. He simply wrote, I fear no loss I fear no loss and that enabled him to keep on going and Christian you should fear no loss oh you may lo lose a lot earthly in earthly terms I may but our treasure is in heaven and all too often we forget this reality but it is true nonetheless our treasures are in heaven and so we can fear no loss. And so let me urge you, the folk in Portadown Baptist Church, whatever the world may throw at us, whatever coronavirus may throw at us in the days that are ahead, let me urge you, like the psalmist, to seek your security in God, to seek your satisfaction in God and to always be still before God. And if you're listening, perhaps you're not even from Portland Down, perhaps you're from somewhere else and you're finding yourself just tuned in today. Let me urge you to find your refuge in God and in none other. 
Let us pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to share your word through these means. And I pray that you will take your word and you will use it to encourage, to strengthen and to bless those who listen. I pray this for Jesus' sake and for his glory. Amen. Thank you to John for a very helpful and very timely message from Psalm 46. In a moment or two I'm going to pray and then after that will be your opportunity to go and get your slice of bread and your juice uh, for uh, communion uh, and uh, there'll be a pause uh, before I hand over to Anthony uh, to uh, to lead us through communion. So when I finish praying uh, that'll be your opportunity to go and get uh, what you need. Uh, can I also encourage you um, after this to uh, to maybe listen to uh, a few songs maybe as you've thought through and listened to the sermon and uh, maybe some songs have come into your mind a couple come into my mind as I was listening to John uh, Be Thou My Vision and Cornerstone were came, two that came to me so maybe can I encourage you to, to maybe listen to those or, or listen to a couple that, that maybe you can think of either either on uh, either music you have yourself um, or um, Google them and, and you'll get them on YouTube and take the opportunity just to listen to, to some music uh, and to, to ponder that and to think through what John has said. Okay, before I hand over to Anthony, let's, uh, let's just pray together. Father, we, we thank you for the comfort uh, that we find in your word. And we thank you for what uh, John has shared with us from Psalm 46. And we thank you this morning that in a world where we seem to have so little control, we thank you that we can still take rest, we can still uh, take refuge and take strength in, in the God who loves us and the God who gave his son for us. That's why, Father, we thank you for the security that we find in you. We thank you that we find you a God that we can flee to in the midst of our chaos, a sure place of, of refuge uh, for our minds as they will be in turmoil through this time. We thank you that you're an ever-present help and that we have security in you. Father, we pray that into our lives you will bring peace in the midst of panic, that we as your people will experience the peace of Jesus Christ that passes all understanding. And the Father, we as your people may be drawn closer to you through this experience. And as people ponder the reality of life and the important things of life, that they will be drawn to your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, bless us we pray through the rest of this week that's going to hold so much uncertainty for us. We pray that we might know your presence and your help every day as we take it day by day. Bless us, protect us and keep us, we pray. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless and stay safe. We have come to this point in the service where we uh, have communion, where we remember the Lord Jesus Christ as our Saviour and what he has done for us. And I just want to share with you two or three verses to help us to focus 
uh, on that. And we're going to turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 23 and verse 33. Let's read together. It says, Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And this is uh, one of the most uh, sad scriptures uh, where we are confronted with the fact that Jesus was rejected and it says uh, they took him to the place that is called Skull, that is called Calvary and there they crucified him. But this wasn't the end for the Lord Jesus Christ because God had a plan and he had a provision and he had a promise. And we read in Luke chapter 24 and verse 6 to 8 the words, He is not here but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and to be crucified and on the third day rise and they remembered his words. And so it wasn't the end for Jesus as we remember him. We remember what he has done. We remember that he went to Calvary. We remember that that was God's plan. But we also remember that God's provision was that Jesus would deal with sin on that cross and we're reminded of that very well known verse in John 3 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life so Jesus came to die for sin came to put away sin uh, but he came to give us eternal life God's promise was that he had come and that he will come back for us in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, it says, And just as it was appointed for man once to die, after that comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. And in these days uh, of anxiety and despair, we rejoice and we remember our Saviour, who was uh, God's plan and God's provision for sin and for eternal life and uh, God's purpose and God's promise in returning for us and taking us to be with him forever. And so we take a moment and we stop from all the busyness and we remember our Saviour as he has commanded us to do. And he has asked and said, remember me. And so we pause as a fellowship this morning and we think soberly, about what Jesus has done for us, about God's great provision for us. And we obey the scripture that is given to us and it's found in 1 Corinthians. And it says, For I have received of the Lord, this was Paul, what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup and after supper, supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And this is what we're doing this morning. We're proclaiming the Lord's death and we're remembering him in just, uh, in just bread and a cup the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're just symbols. Um, we just remember the Lord Jesus Christ and the sacrifice uh, through these symbols. So I'm going to pray now. And after I pray and I give thanks for the emblems both together, we each in our own families here and in your own home uh, take this opportunity to remember the Lord, to, to think on him, to think on what he has done for us. And at the end, I will come back and uh, close our time in prayer. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we come before you now, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you for your plan for us. We thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ came and that he shed his blood in Calvary. He gave his body for us that we might be forgiven for sin. And more than that, Father, that we might have eternal life, that you have promised us that we will live forever with you, that this life is not the end. We acknowledge and recognize that there is nothing in us that deserves your great salvation, that deserves forgiveness. 
And so, Father, we come and we remember our dear Saviour. We remember what he has done for us. We remember what he has given for us. And so, Father, as we take the emblems of the bread and of the cup, Lord, may you accept our sacrifice of worship as we remember him. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's remember our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And let's break the bread and take the cup. Thank you. So we have come to the end of our time together. It's been lovely to enjoy a time of fellowship, even if it is virtually, and to enjoy God's word and what that means to us. And even to enjoy a time of communion this Sunday and to, to be reminded again of all that the Lord has done for us. So it just remains for me now to, to close our time in a word of prayer. And I'd ask you just to bow our heads and let's, let's ask God for his help in the week that we've entered. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your word today. We're thank you, thankful that we can listen to it and that we can learn from it. I pray, Father, that you would help us to apply it to our own hearts and to our own lives. And as in this week we've entered, Father, I just ask that you would go with us and help us and give us strength, protect us from all this out there. We pray, O oh God, that we might be a good witness for your name and that we might know a blessing in your service, Lord. And so we pray the words of scripture and we ask father that you would uh, keep us from stumbling and present us blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy and now to the only god our savior through jesus christ our lord be glory majesty dominion and authority before all time and now and forever amen god bless you